Hello and welcome to Tony Brew Ministries, presenting the old-time preaching from God's Word. Here's a message entitled, The Sorcery of Simon. This thing has never been about a certain person, a certain guy. The guy hour, the one man show, has never been that. No. I want to talk to you about a guy who was in Acts chapter 8, Simon. And he's known as Simon the Sorcerer. And our subject is the sorcery of Simon. Joy had come to this city because Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You will be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. So the gospel had spread out from Jerusalem. They had gotten saved on the day of Pentecost and joy was in Jerusalem and signs and wonders and miracles were taking place and believers were being added to the kingdom of God. This is what you call church building. It's what you call revival. It's, you can have a whole lot of names for it. You can call it Pentecost, you can call it the full gospel, whatever you want to call it, that's what was happening. So the gospel spreads out all around Jerusalem, all in Judea, and now it comes to Samaria. Samaria is a little different place because you're reaching out beyond the bounds of just pure Judaism. You're going into, some people would call it half-breed. You're going into different racial. You're going into different areas. The gospel is not to be bound to a certain area. It's to reach across denominational barriers, racial barriers, all these geographical boundaries that's set. There's no wall that's tall enough. There's no mountain high enough that can keep the gospel out. The gospel is spread out and now it comes to Samaria. Philip goes down there and he preaches Christ unto them. He does not preach church membership. If you come and join our group, you'll be all right. No, he preached Christ to them. That's the group we need to join, the Christ group, the Christian group made up of Baptists and Pentecostal and Methodists and some people don't even know what they are. But when you come to the Lord, it doesn't matter what you are. Then it's about who you are in Jesus Christ. The gospel comes to Samaria. And there's joy in that city. They are hearing something they've never heard before. And they receive Christ. Acts chapter 8 verse 8 teaches that there was great joy in the city of Samaria. Because they had received the word of God. Miracles of healing and deliverance from demons were accompanied by a multitude of conversions. They were getting saved and they were getting right with God. Acts chapter 8 verse 9, but... And so we have people can't see. I said, but, and I done put my hands all up around my face. <laughs> that but changes everything. Yeah. Well, it doesn't change, but you'll know what I'm talking about. Pastor Tony, I know that you need that $20, but... How many of you know that but means I ain't going to get it? <laughs> I could take you to the store, but... I could help you out of that tight spot you're in, but all this joy and revival and everything was going on, but you had this certain man named Simon who before time in the same city used sorcery. He was involved in sorcery. Sometimes sorcery includes drugs, sometimes it doesn't. But this magic... He was involved in magician. He was involved in spells. He was involved in the wicked and bad powers. He used sorcery and he bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. He promoted himself. And he used this art of magic. And through this, he had the people under a spell. He had them under his sway. And they had heard the gospel and they were giving themselves to the Lord. But you had this Simon, you had this problem. To whom, and it's talking about him now, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. You better watch it when you got one man. I don't care whether he's a Christian. I don't care whether he's a devil. I don't care what and who he is. If you got one man that people are giving all this allegiance to, you better watch it. 
The only one man that we need to give allegiance to is Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank God for the pastor. Thank God for the bishop. Thank God for our brothers and sisters. Thank God for the elder. Thank God for the admin council member. But when you start this one man show, you're in a heap of trouble. Amen. This Simon had these people under his spell. He had them under his thumb. For a long time, he had used this power, and they thought he was the power of God. In fact, it says here, they said, to the, from the least to the greatest, this man is the great power of God. He was really on the verge, if not being over the verge, the edge of being worshipped. This man is the great power of God. There are people who are actually on the verge, if not being over into that area, of preacher worship. I call it preacher religion or rebitis. They got rebitis. That's the disease they got. Rebitis. They are preacher worshipers. They are diesel sniffers. Gospel groups say, see what they're going to sing tonight. Well, you better watch out if you start sniffing diesel because the price is going up. Better be careful about doing that. This man is the great power of God, they said. To him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them. That's the second time that word bewitched is used. He had bewitched them with sorceries. They were deceived by the spell because of sin and darkness. When you're in sin and you're in darkness, you are deceived by the devil and by everything that's going on. These people had been held in sway. The whole city had been given over into this man's control. And he controlled their life. He told them what to do with their money. He told them how to feel about certain things. This happens in religious circles. People are controlled. They're influenced by preachers who tell them how much to sin, where to sin. You know, it was Hank Williams who said... The preacher told me to give my money to the Lord, but somehow he always gives me his address. <laughs> Tell me to give my money to God, did you send it to the post office box of my address right here? These people were deceived. And the Bible tells us, do not be deceived. Do not allow anyone to put you under their sway. Because if they put you under their sway, you will never do good enough. You'll never quite be good enough to please them. They'll never be pleased with you. Always do a little bit better. We got preachers like that. They are never quite satisfied. Well, if you please God, I'm satisfied. If you please Jesus, I'm satisfied. You don't have to please me. You have to please the Lord. And if you please the Lord, I'm very much pleased. Amen. This Simon had these people under his sway, under his spell. But, here's another but. This is a good but here. But, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. These people were now being saved. And they had been swayed under the spell of this Simon the sorcerer, but now they're hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, that which cannot put you under spell, but will set you free from captivity. He will set you free. Jesus doesn't come to get your money. He doesn't come to get you tricked out. He doesn't come to put you under a spell. He doesn't come to obligate you something that you really don't want to do. He comes to set you free from all these things. And when He sets you free and saves you, you'll gladly do what He wants you to do. You'll gladly give your money. You'll gladly give your heart and soul because He has set you free. Yes. They believed the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And they were baptized in water. They proved that they followed the Lord, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. You're talking about miracles. Here's a guy that was involved in sorcery and he believed on the Lord. Now he didn't get all the way straightened out. It's like the preacher looking down at the man who died in the church and he said, well, he finally got straightened out. 
Simon didn't get all the way straightened out, but the scripture said he believed. Some people don't believe that he got saved. That's your bizwax if you want to feel that way about it. It said Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs that were done. These people were saved. And Simon was saved, but he had a problem. He had a real problem because his past was involved in magic. And his past was involved in controlling people and using evil powers. And now he's looking at Philip. He's watching Philip, who was operating on the power of the Holy Ghost, and doing these miracles. And this caused Simon to be intrigued. It caused an interest. And the reason that the Lord wants me to bring this out this morning is because sometimes things in our past that we were involved in will continue to intrigue us. doesn't mean that you're not saved. It doesn't mean that you don't love the Lord necessarily. But you have to guard against these things that were so powerful in your past. Some people were involved in sex addiction. Some people were involved in drugs and alcohol. And you say, well, I'm saved now. I love God. I'll just run into the middle of it. No, you don't. The Scripture also said He will deliver you, but it also said you cannot run on coals of fire and not be burned. You cannot take fire in your bosom and nothing happen to you. So we have to guard, we have to be careful against these things. Paul even tells Timothy, he tells Titus, he says, flee from these things. Don't stand there and try to reason them out. Flee from them. Get away from them. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you and I can do is run away from trouble. In fact, if you're born again, you're going to run away from trouble. You're not going to certainly cause trouble. Simon was intrigued. He was wondering and beholding the miracles and signs that were done. These people were saved. And it says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had been baptized in water. And it says here that they were baptized and identified with the name of Jesus. It doesn't mention the word sanctification, but that's exactly what is happening to them. In that time between salvation and baptism of the Holy Spirit, they were being sanctified. Sanctification is the breaking of power of sin over your life. It causes you to be able to deal with these things that Simon the sorcerer needed to have dealt with. These things that are constantly tormenting you. You're a saved. You've been right with God. You've had your life and heart changed. But your nature, you have to deal with that old man. And you can't reason with him. You've got to kill him. You've got to put him in the grave. Amen. You cannot reason with these things. You can't just go in a political way. You can't go to Washington and make another law. That's not going to do it. If we would verify and go by the laws that are already on the book, there'd be a whole lot less laws you'd have to make. All you've got to do is just enforce the laws you've got. Amen. People do the same thing in the religious realm. They want another word. They're looking for another word from God. They want another word. They go to another level. If we would keep the Bible that we have and go by that which we have, we don't need anything else. Amen. When the Spirit of God speaks today, what does He do? And He's already spoken this morning. What is He doing? He is only ratifying. He's buoying up the Word that's already there. Yeah, yeah. God is not speaking against His Word. He'll never do that. Amen. He comes along beside the Word, the written Word, and He gives you the Rahima Word, and He reinforces that. Amen. Tongues, interpretation, prophecy, the gifts of the Spirit, all that is done not to go against the Bible that's already there, but to go alongside with the Word and to strengthen that Word in your heart. Yeah, if you're looking for another Word to believe God, if you don't believe what's already there, it's like the rich man in the story. Rich man dies and goes to hell. The poor man God dies and goes into Abraham's bosom. Send him there to my father's house that they may be saved. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. Oh no, but if one came from the dead, they will believe. He says, no, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if one were to come back from the dead. 
And that's a proof because one did come back from the dead named Jesus and they don't believe Him either. If you don't believe the Word that God has given you in John 3.16 and John 3.17, you're not going to believe a Word that somebody speaks in the Spirit. You may be blessed temporarily by it. But if you're going to go by the Word of God, you will believe the Bible He's already given you. These people were sanctified and they were waiting for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost. They were saved. They were sanctified. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were delivered from the spell by the full gospel. The full gospel is, and you may have heard that expression, the full gospel. What does it mean? Well, it's the gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of sanctification. The gospel of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The full gospel includes the gifts of the Spirit and Pentecost and the power of the Holy Ghost. The full gospel. Not just saying Jesus will help you out of a tight spot, out of a hot spot. He'll forgive your sins. That's wonderful. We need our sins forgiven. But we also need power to live the Christian life. Amen. He will save you. He will sanctify you. He'll baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And these people in Samaria, they needed something hotter than a lot of religious crowd has today. The religious crowd, they have a hot something all right. They're headed for a hot place. If some of them don't get saved, they get right with God. And that's not a judgment. That's just the way it is. You can be religious, but you can still be lost and die and go to hell. Jesus is not looking for religious people. He's looking for pure out old sinners just like you and I. Those who didn't know anything about God. Maybe you knew a lot about God. doesn't matter. You're still a sinner. You can be an illiterate sinner. You can be a religious sinner. It doesn't matter. You're still a sinner. But when you come to Jesus Christ, He washes your sins away. Amen. These people have heard the gospel. The gospel of salvation, yes. The gospel of sanctification, yes. The gospel of the Holy Spirit. The full gospel. And they were delivered from this spell that was over them by the... Blessing and power of the full gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of that gospel. It's the power of God to salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. This gospel that I'm talking about will set you free. This gospel that I'm talking about will heal. This gospel that I'm talking about will raise the dead. This gospel that I'm talking about will take a man out of the pool hall and put him in the church hall. Amen. This gospel of what I'm talking about will take you out of the world of sin, put you in the kingdom of God. Amen. That's what this is all about. Amen. When Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay my hands, they may receive the Holy Ghost. He wanted the ability to do this, and he even offered them money to do it. Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God, which the Holy Spirit is the gift of God, Amen. you thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. The gift of God is not only, cannot be purchased with money, but it's not even available at any price. No price can pay for the gift of God. Amen. The price for the gift of God has already been paid, and that's the price that Jesus paid. Amen. No price, no money in the world could buy one ickling of the power of God. Amen. Because it's not available for money. Amen. It's available freely because Jesus has already paid the price in full. Yeah. Amen. He was not even there. In fact, he said, thou hast no part nor lot in this matter. You have no part in it. That means you're not right. You're not ready. He might have thought he was ready. And he hadn't believed, but he was not right. You say, well, how can you believe and not be right? I've been a lot of times since I've been a Christian. I was a believer, but I was not right. My heart wasn't right. I wasn't right towards a brother, perhaps. I wasn't right towards a sister. I wasn't right towards my family. I wasn't right towards a decision or some situation that I was dealing with. There have been many times since I've been a Christian, and maybe this is a bad time to be Tony Confession Hour, but there have been many times since I've been a Christian that I was a believer, but I was not right. Or as we say in these areas, I won't write. I was not right. You have no part nor lot. The lot means 
Not only are you you're not right, you're not ready for it, but you don't have anything to say about it. Some people think they always got something to say about everything. Say so when you put them in front of the crowd, then they clam up. But you can get off in a corner and tell everybody everything. Well, Jesus said what's been told in the ear will be put out on the housetop. You better be careful. Thou neither has part nor lots in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. There have been times when my heart was not right in the sight of God. And I had to come clean with God. I had to repent. I had to get things right. Amen. And you, sometime in the church, people think that just because I've come to Christ 40 years ago, that I'm always right in everything I do. And that's not true. Amen. We've got people that's gone away from our church. They think that what they're doing is right. And they're just as wrong as Simon the sorcerer. Their heart is not right in the sight of God. Yes. It's not right in the sight of God because it's not right with the church. It's not right with God. It's not right with the elders. It's not right with the admin council. It's not right with their brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not right in the sight of God, just like Simon. Their heart was not right. Yes. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. Not only Simon the sorcerer, but some church folks need to repent of their wickedness. They need to be careful of who they're following. They need to be careful of who they're giving their money to. Repent. That's what you do when you need to come back to God, when you need to get things right with God. It's not just turning over a new leaf. It's not just renewing things and fixing things up. He says repent. Repent. God said, the Apostle Paul, all men need to repent. Now Jesus said, if you're in the kingdom of God, you have the 90 and 9 which need no repentance. That means they don't need to get saved. They're already saved. But saved people sometimes need, we need to repent. He tells the church in Ephesus, you've lost your first love. You're believers, you're Christians, but you need to repent. These people that teach that the church, when you're in the church, you get in the church, you never need to repent. You never need to say, I'm sorry. I don't know what planet they're living on. I don't know what Bible they're reading from either. If Paul had to repent, if the disciples had to repent, if the other church had to repent, we need to repent. Amen. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Simon, you've got a decision to make. You can either lay here and stew in this mess that you've made. You can blame somebody else. You can blame me. You can blame the people of Samaria. You can blame the elder board. You can blame the admin council. You can blame the preacher who was here. You can blame the preacher who might be here. You can blame your mama. You can blame your daddy. You can blame your third grade teacher. You can blame somebody who stole your french fries from you at McDonald's when you're six years old. You can blame the White House, you can blame the Black House, you can blame ABC, you can blame the networks, you can blame somebody, you can blame racism, you can blame all kind of things. But when it comes down, quit playing the blame game and get right with God. Yeah. You're caught in this thing, Simon. You've got a decision to make. You can be bitter about it. You're in the gall of bitterness. You're in the bond of iniquity. And what did Simon do? He said, I'm out of here. I'm through with the church. I don't want to have anything. I knew it was a trick. No. He said, then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. He humbled himself down. I don't know why preachers that preach about this never talk about the humbling of Simon because he did. He said, Pray for me. Pray for me that none of these things which you have spoken will come upon me. He feared God enough to say, pray for me. I don't want these things to come upon me. Destroying the spell through repentance and humility. If we come to the place where we see our position and we see the mistake, the Bible calls it the error of your way. You can see the error of your way and you can repent. You can get right with God. You know how much time it takes to get right with God when you've done something wrong? It takes about as much time to get right with God as when you've done something wrong as it did when you get saved and get right to start with. Just like that, you can be right with God. 
Why do people hold on? Why do people hold out? Why do they blame everybody else? I may say, why do we blame everybody else? Instead of coming clean, all we have to do is just come clean. You know, your pappy told you, if you'll just let me whip you and get this thing over with, instead of holding out, holding out, trying to run away, it's going to make a whole lot worse. Because when you ran away, he could get some arm leverage on him and really hurt you good then. If you just hug up to him and say, oh, diddy, diddy, diddy. I got two sisters. They don't have a daddy, they got a diddy. They didn't call him diddy. Oh, diddy, diddy, diddy. I'm sorry, diddy. If you hug up to dad, he can't whip you nearly as hard as he can if you run away from him. That's the way it is with God. God will lay the hickory to your heart if he has to. But you're a whole lot better when you get right with God. You can destroy that spell. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. We are not under a spell. He has delivered us from that curse. That spell, that curse of sin and darkness that was over our life has rolled away and we've been forgiven and we're in the kingdom of God. And when anything comes along the pipe to try to hinder that fellowship and do away with that fellowship, the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart and immediately we see the error of our way and we get right with God because we don't want anything to hinder our fellowship between us and God. Amen. The spell is broken through repentance and humility. Humbling ourselves in the sight of God is of great price in the kingdom of God. If we're proud, if we're stubborn, if we're hard-hearted, He can't do anything with us. But if we humble ourselves in the sight of God, Scripture said, if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Amen. If you're hard, you're rugged, He can't deal with you. And God can do anything, but He can't deal with you because you're too stiff and too hard and resistant. You're hard-hearted. But if you have a tender heart, if you have an humble attitude before God, Lord, here I am, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. We humble ourselves before God. He saves us. And as a Christian, you don't know it all just because a Christian. Nobody does. We have to humble ourselves before God. Come clean with our sin and humble ourselves before God. As we, as Christians, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Don't justify it. Don't say, well, nobody can blame me for what I did. Don't matter whether they blame you or not. When you stand before God, it doesn't matter whether you're right, whether you're wrong, whether... All that matters is you've got to get right with God. You've got to stay right with God. Be right. Stay right. When Jesus comes, you'll be glad you did. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be in this place today, to have heard what we have heard, to have seen what we have seen, to witness the moving of the Spirit of God and the power of God. We thank you, Lord, today for this man who has taught us a lesson from your word in Acts chapter 8, that we can come clean with God. We can repent of our wickedness. We can repent when we've sinned and come short of the glory of God. When we have meant to do it, we can get right. And even when we don't mean to do it, we can still get right. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you that you have provided the way. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is our lawyer. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sin of the whole world. And we admit, Lord, as believers, we admit that we have missed the mark. We admit that we have come short. We admit, Lord, that we have not done things right all the time. And we ask you to forgive us this morning. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, from the things that we have done. Lord, we want to be clean in your sight. We want to be ready when you come again. We thank you, Lord, that when you come, we'll be ready to go to be with you. Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to a message from God's Word from the book of Acts. The title has been The Sorcery of Simon. Be sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Make sure that you make Him your Lord today. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.